I'm sure people in Pakistan don't aspire for anything else, they also aspire for their well-being. It is just that certain forces in every nation behave like they represent every human being in that country, but it is not true. The political leadership can only set agenda, can only make policy, but the real nation happens depending upon how the business will buzz in this country. Well, this is a rags to riches story, but still consciously remains in rags, how many people can do this? There is no such thing as this is my life and that is your life. This is a living cosmos. At this time, we have of race tensions. How do you ask people to move forward, how, how to do things in a way which allows them to find a common ground? When we invest in problems, problems multiply. It would be wise to invest in solutions. But in a democratic nation, when you take everybody's opinions and emotions and considerations, it's very difficult to move in any one direction. But I feel this wouldn't be a very difficult problem to solve if there is an abstinence from daily violence that's unleashed in the form of terror. The old philosophy of thousand cuts is still being executed. When that's going on, it becomes very difficult to even talk about a solution. Aspiring for peace is definitely in everybody's heart, but when it is being declared by the proponents of this violence very clearly, our goals are not geographic, that is Kashmir is not the goal. Once we liberate Kashmir, we will liberate the rest of India. When these things have been clearly stated, I don't see how you can talk with the same people endlessly peace because it's ridiculous. So I feel the region has to make efforts to bring an economic prosperity. I think if the rest of the countries show economic prosperity, I'm sure people in Pakistan don't aspire for anything else, they also aspire for their well-being. It is just that certain forces in every nation behave like they represent every human being in that country, but it is not true. You should see the bonhomie that Indians and Pakistanis have outside the country, <laughs> when they're outside that region. The political leadership can only set agenda, can only make policy, but the real nation happens depending upon how the business will buzz in this country. Well, I know there are difficulties, I know there are challenges, there are problems of corruption, there are problems of variety of things, roadblocks all over the place. But this is our time. We can talk about glorious past, it doesn't matter. This is our time on this planet. Whether we will make this the greatest time in the history of humanity or we will make it the worst time is all in our hands. There are many challenges. There are ecological challenges, there are nourishment challenges, there are organizational challenges, there is investment challenges. But the possibility is so big that these problems look small in terms of what is possible for this nation. India as a nation has a great future because as I said earlier, without evolving great human beings, there is no great nation. This has been our strength. We have never been a very organized process, but individual genius always unfolded in this country because we did not believe anything. We were always seekers. This is not a religion, this is understanding the intelligence of ignorance, understanding that the phenomena of life is always on full fire if you are in a seeking mode. If you come to your believing mode, you settle down. But when you are in a seeking mode, you are continuously on fire. So this fire we have exhibited for thousands of years, we should not lose this fire because this is where our growth is, this is where our future is. When we look at Sadhguru riding a bike, flying a plane, playing golf, you know, 
mentoring CEOs or collaborating with CEOs of the companies. They feel that where what is because yog mein to aisa nahi hai. On the other hand, when they see Baba Ramdev, you know, being someone who's discussed, and I've been in so many meetings where he is discussed as uh, someone who's, who's a strategic mind of how marketing uh, should be done in today's India and he's found an innovative way of doing it and uh, there is of course his, his company is a case study. Is there a contradiction at all or, or there is none between this yoga and bhog? Certain people think uh, either yoga or the spiritual process or spirituality is a, some kind of a disability. That's their understanding, unfortunately. If spirituality is a disability, we should ban it immediately. Why practice a disability? Spirituality is a way of empowering yourself in such a way that we can enhance life to a point where other people will think it's superhuman. Because as life, we have only two ingredients. There is time and there is energy. It is only the energy we can manage. By accumulations, your life is not enhanced. Maybe in other people's eyes you are enhanced. As a life, you are no way enhanced. Only by enhancing your energy, only by having mastery over this, do you have access and purchase into this life. Because time is not in your hands, it's just rolling away for everybody. Wherever I go, people are asking this question, a yogi is doing business, is it all right? Well, this is a rags to riches story. But still consciously remains in rags, how many people can do this? Huh? <laughs> it's a total rags to riches story but consciously remains in rags, that's not a simple story. We're missing the whole point. Sannyas means indiscriminate passion towards everything but dispassion towards myself. If you have dispassion towards everybody, I think that's a crime. My question is, how do I see or understand Adiyogi as, as a Swayambhu, which is self-born and Ajja as unborn since both are contradictory? Also, he, he is referred as limitless and nothingness. So can you, can you please state your opinion? So Adiyogi literally means the first yogi. A yogi means who consciously obliterated all boundaries around him. This is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. But I want you to understand, there is no such thing as this is my life and that is your life. This is a living cosmos. If you identify with the fundamental life process, it's not here, it's just happening all over the place. So in that sense we are saying he is limitless because he is not sitting there as a body nor is he sitting there as a psychological structure. Both these things are outside influences on you. About him being a Swayambhu, it means that he is self-made, everything that he is. See, today you are sitting here, you may not be conscious, but your father, mother, your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents, if you go a hundred thousand, generations, all of them are in some way living through you. What you call as myself right now is not you. It is a consequence of a huge amalgamation of memory. A little bit you have added your character to it, but rest of it is all come to you from somewhere else. So when we say a Swayambhu, because he is no way using his ancestry, no way using the faculties or the memories of the body, he has placed himself above that. He is completely himself, not a consequence of history, not a consequence of genetics, but he is all by himself. So we call him, he is totally self-made or he is a Swayambhu.